over my notes and seeking the Lord's face on the next message in this series that he's given us, Jesus told 12, Jesus chose 12, and how that Jesus used the process that God had already put into place on how he chose people. Last week, we talked about Balaam and how God used a donkey to speak to Balaam because he didn't want to listen to God. Meaning that he'll use anyone or anything to reach us. Nobody in this room can ever say God did not try to reach you because he's always trying to reach us. And you have a choice. Do you want to hear it from God or do you want to hear it from a donkey, right? I know I'd rather hear it from the Lord, and he's been working in my life in that. But as I was reading this story in Joshua chapter 2, all that just kept coming to my mind was the power of redemption. The power of redemption. The power of redemption. In just a moment, we're going to read a story about a prostitute named Rahab who lived in Jericho. This was the city that was standing in between the people of Israel and them entering into the promised land. It was known for its power, its position, its height, because it was in one of the highest places that protected uh, the valley of Canaan from being entered into. In order to enter into Canaan, you had to go through Jericho. And so this city was fortified and built to withstand any attacks from anyone. In fact, the uniqueness of this city was that the way that it was built is it was sloped so that when you attack the city, you had to climb not one slope, not two slopes, but several slopes to get to the city itself. So if you got to one slope successfully, you had to climb another one. And if you got to that one successfully, you had to climb another one. In fact, history, what it says is there were approximately six slopes that armies had to climb to get to Jericho. And before Israel gets there, Jericho is considered impenetrable. No one has ever defeated Jericho. Now, all of a sudden, here come the people of Israel. And I want to point out something to you about the people of Israel getting ready to cross the Jordan. It's not the people that came out of Egypt. Those people have died because they complained. And so anybody 20 years or older had been removed by the Lord. So what I'm saying to you, Inez, is these people were young people. What I'm saying to you, Millie is that there were young ladies in this group. What I'm saying to our young people is there were not old people there to give you mentorship. They were gone. They had to encourage one another. And they were given a leader. His name was Joshua. They were given a leader to lead them into this land. Now, also understand it, that that. Israel is not known for its armies. They'd been slaves. They hadn't had a chance to really build up any kind of army. They'd been slaves, farmers, brick builders. So the weapons that they had were spears. That's what they used was spears. There were a few swords, but they didn't have chariots. They didn't have horses. They didn't have all of that. They literally were holding spears and handmade swords to step into this battle. And so no army had ever been able to defeat Jericho. Now here comes these young people before Jericho, not known as being a great army. But let me tell you, God doesn't need City Reach or any other church to be known as a great church. He just needs the world to know that he is a great God for his church. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord this morning? He is a great God for his church, and we're going to see that here. So as Joshua comes, he knows now that they've got to go into the city, defeat the city. And so he sends two spies to go up into the city. So in the first part of Joshua chapter 2, this is what's happened. He has sent two spies into the city. And when they go in there, they find refuge with a prostitute. 
And I find this interesting because it made sense to me that if you are going to hide out in a city of your enemies, what better place to go to than the house of a prostitute? Because who's going to look for you there? See, because most people who go there don't want to be noticed. They don't want to be noticed. And so the spies go to Rahab, and they get refuge from Rahab. They're not seeking to sleep with her. They're not seeking to take advantage of her. But as they're spying out the area, they realize that the best cover that they can have is here with a prostitute. And we pick up this story here. Now the king's men know that they're spies. They've heard spies have come, and so they're looking for where those spies could be. And when we pick this up, the, the king's men have just come to Rahab and said, hey, are the spies here? We heard they're spies. And she tells them, no, they're not here. In fact, you need to go and look for them in the valley because I do believe that they left before the gates of the city were closed for the night. They snuck out and they headed back towards the valley. And we pick up this story at verse 8. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. Listen to what Rahab says. I want you to highlight this area. This is so important because we look at Jericho and we want to think about how Joshua and Israel influences Rahab. It is not Joshua and Israel that will influence Rahab. It is God who will influence her. It says in verse 9, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Highlight that. We are all afraid of you. What am I saying? The enemies of God are afraid of him. Hello? The enemy of God, the enemies that come against you are afraid of God. And if he is your God, then they are afraid of your God. That's how you can walk in victory because you already know the enemy is afraid of your God. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. They aren't talking about, oh, how mighty are your armies. No, they talk about how we know that the supreme God fights for you. We just sung about, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why? Because the supreme God fights for those that are his children this morning. He fights for you. And the enemy knows that. My question to you this morning is, do you know that? Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when they, were, they have returned, you can go on your way. I want to stop there for just a moment because here it says something really key. She tells them to hide in the hill country, which is very interesting because Jer uh, Jericho is perched up high on a mountain in the hill country. And Jericho considers itself to be the pinnacle of protection for the valley Kind of like what the devil thought when he wanted to be the pinnacle of God's temple. In fact, not just God's temple, but God's throne. See, Jericho resented pride and arrogance. They thought they were at the highest point. The enemy thought that he needed to be at the highest point. I want to speak this truth to you that God gave me through the spirit that really spoke to my heart. Because here's what God said. Man wants position while all I want to do is place man. God said it's not about position, George. It's about placement. I am the God of placement. I already hold the position. And you're receiving that this morning from the Holy Spirit. We have been a people that have wanted position. And God says, I have the position. And because I hold the position, I'm a God that places you where I want you. 
See, we have become dissatisfied with where we're at. We complain so much about where we're at because we want position. We don't want to be satisfied with placement. But God didn't come to give you a position. He came to place you because he has the ultimate position. I didn't call myself to preach. God called me to preach. God called you to teach. You didn't call yourself. Inez, you didn't call yourself to the mission field. God called you. Denise, God didn't call you to be a mother. Or, excuse me, you didn't call yourself to be a mother. God placed you to be a mother. Amen? All over this room, it's not been about your position. It's about you becoming satisfied with where God places you. And where God places you, he equips you. And so I find it interesting that what does Rahab do? She tells these arrogant soldiers of the king, Go look for them in the valley. And they do, because they think they're at the highest point. And then she turns to the soldiers and says, you want refuge? Go to the hill country. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Psalms filled with a bunch of God being our refuge and our strength? Right? Right? He's our refuge and our strength. And isn't he at the highest point? Amen? Amen? Absolutely. As I look at you and Lisa right now, it is him placing you two together because you were where you lived and where you lived, you would never know each other. But here you two are today doing the work of the Lord here in his house today. Why? Because he placed you there. And you can be satisfied knowing that it was God in his position that placed you. Do you feel the Spirit speaking to our hearts this morning, preparing us right here, right now? Then it says here, um, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety. The men agreed, if you don't betray us, we will keep our promises and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then since Rahab's house was built, she lets him down out the window by a rope, and she tells him to go to the hillside. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. (laughs) I'm here to help you with something that hopefully will help you see how much God loves you. See, these men spoke a truth that that is also a truth with God. It said here, if you will stay bound to the covenant and the promises we made, follow that, then we will fulfill our covenant. But we're such an arrogant and proud people that we want to be able to do whatever we want and still hold God to his promises. Well, God, you said you're going to be faithful all the time, God. Well, yeah, I'll be faithful all the time to those who will recognize me as their Lord and Savior. To those who obey my commandments. Because if you read your Bible, you will find out God is faithful to those who obey. Who obey. See, God keeps his covenant. Period. But he made a promise to the obedient. And then he made another promise to the disobedient. If you disobey and live a life of disobedience... You ain't getting blessed. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. What about these people who don't know God and, and they're pounding their chest and they're building these great high rises and they have all the money in the world and they have. First of all, you just said it. They have everything of this world. But here's what I heard in my word I'm not of this world. I live in it, but I'm not of it. I'm not looking for things in this world to satisfy me. I used to think that a Whopper satisfied me. Then I found out I needed a Whopper with cheese to satisfy me. And then the Whopper with cheese didn't do it anymore. I had to get a double Whopper with cheese. And then that didn't satisfy me anymore. So I got a double Whopper with cheese and bacon. And then that didn't satisfy me anymore. So I went with a triple Whopper with cheese, bacon, and jalapenos. And then I stepped on a scale and I weighed 266 pounds. And I said, God, what has happened to me? And he said, you look for your peace and satisfaction in food, not in me. You're getting fat in the things of this world. And that was right after I had a stroke. And when I was in there, I said, God, what is it? Why did I have this stroke? And he said, you did this to yourself. The stroke wasn't in the plans. But let me tell you how awesome I am. I'm not going to let the stroke destroy the plans I have for your life. 
I had diabetes, guys. There's a word. Had. I had diabetes. And God said, it's your fault you have diabetes. Let me change your life. Let me transform your mind. You can enjoy sugar-free things, and they're delicious. You can enjoy vegetables, and they're delicious. You can have a salad and be full. My life changed. And within three months after being told I had diabetes, I didn't have diabetes. But God didn't reward my disobedience. He rewarded my obedience. Church, he wants to reward obedience. But if you're still going to live with one foot in the world, then you will pay the consequences of living in the world. And that is not God's fault because he's already told you his covenant is for those who obey. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord? Before they left, of course, the man told her to follow this. And then in verse 18, when we come into the land, you must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which... Uh, you let us down and all your family members, your father, mother, brother, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out into the street, uh, they will be killed. It will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside this house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. So Rahab said, I accept your terms. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. Spies went up into the hill country and stayed there three days. (laughs) That spoke to my heart. You know why? Because Jesus went somewhere for three days. And when he came back, he was completely victorious. These men went and hid in the presence of God. That's where they went. The enemy was down looking for them in the valley. He figured they were hiding like scared animals. But you don't have to be scared, and you don't have to hide in the shadows of the valley when you can fall underneath the wonderful, majestic wings of the Almighty. You want to live in the shadows, live under the shadows of the greatest eagle that we could ever know, our God. Amen? Amen. And so it goes on to say that they went up there, and the men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but they finally returned without success. What is this saying to you as a believer? Never once has the enemy been able to defeat a child of God. Never once. In other words, some of you need to be set free to say, well, I'm a child of God, but I feel defeated. Wait, time out. You cannot be a child of God and feel defeated. What? You heard me. You cannot be a child of God and feel defeated because when I recognize I'm a child of God, I have never felt defeated. I have felt victorious. You know what I do, and and some of you may think I'm crazy, but I'm going to just tell you, sometimes I feel like a fever coming on. I feel like my lungs filling up and all that. And you know what I do? I don't go, oh, God, help me through my sickness. No. I stand up and say, I'm a child of God. I don't receive this infirmity in the name of Jesus, so you got to leave my body right now. Oh, and by the way, when you leave my body, you can't stick it to my wife, and you can't take it to the children. I cover them in the blood of Jesus. You know, sometimes we get an infirmity off our body, but our children or family members we love receive it because we don't cover them in the process. We're so selfish about us feeling well, we forget to pray for everybody else to be well. But I have literally watched temperatures My lungs clear in a matter of moments because I refuse to believe as a child of God that I am defeated. It's time for us as a church to believe that as a children of God that we are not defeated. These guys went, couldn't find the spies. They were the defeated ones even before the wall fell down. The message was clear. They will be defeated because they are defeated. Then the two spies came down from the hill country, crossed the Jordan, and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. Listen to this. They had just been with a prostitute. Let me say that again. They had just been with a prostitute. But check out what verse 24 says. The Lord has given us the whole land. They said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. Where did they get that from? They didn't get it from a priest. They didn't get it from the Pope. They didn't get it from a TV evangelist. They didn't get it from a motivating speaker. They didn't get it from a revival. They got it through a prostitute. But here's the thing. 
you'll notice in here that they don't say they got this from a prostitute because after they make the covenant with Rahab, God shows them that she's no longer a prostitute. Because earlier on, she declares who God is. She makes a statement of faith who God is. In other words, what I'm saying, when you make the statement of faith that God has transformed your life, quit thinking you're a prostitute. Quit thinking you're a loser. Quit thinking that you can't pass school. Quit thinking that you are incapable of doing what God has called you to do. God said he's going to use the weak to shock the strong, and he's going to use the fools to confound the wise. Well, pastor, I don't want to feel like a fool. Well, then stop calling yourself a fool. Pastor, I don't want to feel weak. Well, then stop calling yourself weak, because in God, who is your strength, You'll never feel weak. But he's got to be your strength. So guess what? There are times when pastor walks in the flesh and I feel weak. You know what I have to do? I have to remember God is my strength. There's times when I feel dumb, mama. There are, there are times like when I was going through the word here, I had to call my, my daddy and my mommy yesterday because I got confused on something I was processing yesterday. And so I called mommy and daddy yesterday and said, I feel like a fool. Can you help me? And my mom and dad pulled out their Bibles and they helped me clear my mind and have peace about this message this morning. But I don't have to be the only one to walk like that. You can walk in that too. You can encourage one another. You can love on each other. See, here's the thing. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, just a couple more verses here. Joshua chapter 1. God makes a promise to Joshua. I want you to hear this. This is so interesting because after he makes this promise, it's Joshua chapter 2 that God begins to fulfill that promise through a prostitute. Look at this. Joshua chapter 1, verses 7, or excuse me, let's start at verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, either turning to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. You know what, Sister Terry? It's not just for Joshua. That's for all the children of God. That is for all the children of God. And that's why your brothers got saved. And that's why your husband Tom is going to get saved. Because God's going to keep his promises. You're staying faithful to say, I'm going to still believe, believe, believe. Hey, praying is great. But praying without believing, you might as well not be praying. Amen. But you pray and believe. And we'll stand in agreement. And I'm telling you, one of these days, there's going to be Tom sitting right there next to you. And then he's going to get up and testify about how he gave his life to the Lord. You know why I can say that? Because that is God's will. That's why I can say it. It is God's will. But we have to hang in there. We have to believe this. And he's telling you need to not deviate from what I've told you. You will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually, meditated on a day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Just in case you were wondering, where do we get the direction for daily devotional? It's right there. What was good for Joshua is good for us. Amen? Amen. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And here's the thing. It is not Joshua who sends the spies in to encourage somebody there that they're going to meet to say, hey, if you'll help us, this is what's going to happen. No, the spies come back and say, hey, we just want to let you know, Josh, remember when God told you not to be afraid and be discouraged for he was going to be with you and you were going to be successful? Well, a prostitute just told us that. Wait, what? Yeah, and by the way, we made a, 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 a covenant with her that if she keeps everything in secret that she's going to be saved and she gets to come and be a part of us. Let me show you something that's so exciting about Rahab. Two things and we close. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. This is right before uh, we read about Jesus' birth. So I know this was very important. Matthew, you know, we talk about genealogies and we wonder, uh, is that really important? You know, and we look at the book of Numbers and we're seeing all these genealogies. Like, is that, yes, it's very important. And let me tell you why. Because without genealogies, you and I would not be here. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
It seems silly, but it's true. Without genealogies, we wouldn't be here. So don't you think it would be a good idea for God to take the time to show us where we came from? Amen. You know what's so cool about this, Farzim? I went back, read the genealogies. My dad helped me with this. Read the genealogies. You know what I found out? I'm not from an ape. And you know what else I found out? I'm not from slum, scum. I'm not from out of a pond. I'm not out from an explosion. I have a mom, a dad, a great-grandpa, a great-great-grandpa, a great-great-great-great-grandpa. Oh, and by the way, I have the best thing of all. I have a heavenly father. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord this morning? Check this out. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Judah, so we know Jesus comes through the lineage of the tribe of Judah. Judah was the father of Bedez and Zerah, so we know that, that they had Mexican food back in the day. All right, there was a Bedez there, right? And whose mother's name was Tamar. I don't have time to go into Tamar, guys, but I want you to go back, read the story of Tamar, because this story, I mean, you want to talk about disaster. Her life was a disaster, and yet what we will find out is there's still redemption through the line of Judah. So it literally begins with Judah and Tamar. So you want to read that story. I encourage you, go back, read what God does with Judah and Tamar. And so there was, Bedez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram, and Ram was the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon, or Salma, and Salma was the father of Boaz, whose mother, Rahab. Rahab. Whose mother was Rahab. Now, I was reading something that got me confused. I had someone who said, there's no way Rahab was, in, uh, was the mother because all these years passed. And, and so they were, there was all this confusion with the genealogy. And I was like, oh, my gosh, God, give me wisdom discernment. So I called my parents. And I said, Dad, this is what I see the word of God saying. And if God meant this to be a different Rahab, I think he would have said so. I don't think. And my dad says, no, let me tell you, son, you got the right Rahab. But we went through the word of God together, and it's in Hebrews chapter 11 that we'll go to in just a moment, where I, I know for sure that this is the Rahab he's talking about. But let me just talk about Sama first. All right. So Sama marries Rahab after she is saved. See, Jericho gets destroyed, but Rahab lives, and she lives among the people, she lives among the people of Israel for the rest of her life. Right? Now, there is conjecture. Hear this. I want you to understand conjecture. In other words, this is just someone's thoughts. It doesn't mean it happened because we can't find it in the Bible saying for sure. But Sama was a prince, basically, in Israel. He had a high position in Israel. Now, it is believed that he possibly was one of the two spies that Joshua would have sent into the land because of his position, because he didn't have a lot of people he could send because it was a bunch of young people. So he had to be very selective with who he sent. But I want to just make it very clear now. Don't get it confused and say this is biblical. No, it is just conjecture that it's possible that he may have been one of the two spies that went. And if, in fact, he was, then he made a covenant with Rahab, which, oh, by the way, if he makes that covenant with Rahab and he comes back and tells Joshua, we made this covenant, when Rahab comes in, she's not married. It says she had brothers, sisters, a mom, and a dad. It doesn't say she has kids. And she's a prostitute, right? And so Joshua, being the man who loved covenants, would have said to this man, well, you know what? Since you guys made a covenant with her, you probably should be the one to marry her. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened. Please understand that. But I want you to just get a taste of how God's mind works. It works beyond what we could ever imagine. Because my wife lived in Michigan. I lived in South Carolina. There is no way her and I should be doing ministry together today except for the, one, except for the fact that God planned it that way. So no matter what I did on my end to run from God, he was still going to fulfill his plan. I still ran into that woman. And I tried to shake her off time and time again, and she was like a bulldog hanging on to a piece of meat going, you are not going nowhere, buddy. And I'm so thankful for my wife who believes in the covenant of God because she made a covenant with God. That's what she told me about our marriage. She said, it wasn't about making a covenant with you. It was about making a covenant with God. That mattered more to me. And you were not going to make me break that covenant with God. The power of covenant, right? So whether Selma was one of the spies and ends up marrying her 
The bottom line is here that Rahab is in line with the tribe of Judah because of who she marries. It is Selma, which, oh, by the way, let me just tell you what Selma means very quickly. Selma means covering her mantle. In other words, Rahab, in her faith, received redemption through her husband. That's good stuff right there. I, I got all excited. I got all, as, as, as my, my mom and dad would say, I got Twitter-pated. And I'm looking over at Laura, and she's like, why are you looking at me that way? And I'm just like, there's an amazing love story going on here, babe, and it's just like so awesome. And she's like, stop looking at me like that. But I'm excited because God's love for us is a true love story. There's nothing like it in all the world. It doesn't matter what the circumstance is. It doesn't matter who your family was. It no matter what they did. It doesn't matter if they made idols because, hey, Abraham's family made a whole bunch of idols. And guess what? Abraham became the father of Israel. Amen. He left idols for one God. Amen. This is just exciting when I think about what's going on in the word of God. Now, here is Rahab. And now, if you go back and read Ruth, Ruth is a foreigner, too. She's a Moabite. And, and she comes with her mother-in-law back into a country, right, of Israel, right? She's back there, and she meets Boaz. Oh, by the way, Boaz is the son of Selma, who, oh, by the way, was the covering for Rahab. And the Bible tells us in Ruth, if you'll go and read Ruth, another great book to read, if you go and read Ruth, you'll find out that in the story, she is told by her mother-in-law that if Boaz is to take her, she needs to go and lie by his feet. And if he will take his garment and cover her, then she knows that she is going to be his. And in that story, Boaz covers Ruth. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying when covering starts, it keeps going. Amen. What I'm saying is, Mark and Lisa, you have a covering. What I'm saying to you, Denise, and your children is, you have a covering. What I'm saying to you, Inez, is you have a covering. What I'm saying to all of you back there, and all of you back there, and all of you here in the front, you have a covering. It's called redemption. It is amazing. And if we take this all the way back to true covering, think about when God covers Adam and Eve. Amen. And then the sons of Noah cover Noah. Amen. In other words, what I'm telling you, church, if we're going to walk in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we need to start covering each other in the Spirit. We're not going to see a bunch of manifestations up here at the altar and everything like that. I know sometimes we see them, we're just like, when is that going to happen? Now, let me tell you, the most powerful manifestation that can happen is when two people of God come together and watch God move in their life. It needs to happen out here. It needs to happen in your neighborhood. It needs to happen at your workplace. And you may say, well, they told me at work that uh, if I talk about Jesus. So in other words, you're more concerned about whether or not God can truly take care of you. Because the people at your work are going to hell. You know the way. You won't tell them the way. God's going to hold you accountable for that. This is such a powerful story of redemption, the power of redemption. Turn your Bibles to Hebrew 11 in closing. Hebrew 11 in closing. But I want to give you this statement that the Holy Spirit gave me. He said, George, the power of redemption manifests the promises of purity. The power of redemption manifests the power of purity. Because when you are redeemed, the Bible says you are washed clean. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love what David said even before Jesus came and died for our sins. He said to the Lord, wash me or cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. This is the power of redemption because it manifests purity. One of the biggest struggles with doubt and fear and bondage is we don't feel clean. We're still running around going unclean, unclean, unclean. And it's not because somebody in the church is saying you're unclean. It's because you're saying you're unclean. But if you have truly given your life to Jesus Christ and he is your Lord and Savior, then I'm here to tell you today, you are not unclean. You have been clean. And oh, by the way, 
Gabe, if you do sin, just confess it to the Lord, and he will forgive you immediately and wash you white as snow, brother. I know it works. I know it works. I use it daily. You know why repentance stands out so strong in my life today? Because I decided I would use it daily. I don't sit around and, and wait until I think God wants to hear from me. He, wants, if, he doesn't want me to be separated from him. He didn't want Rahab to be separated from him. So what does he do? He has her use not just any kind of rope. She uses a scarlet rope. Do we have that picture real quick before we read the scripture of Rahab? I want you to see this picture of Rahab that I found. You'll find it in just a minute. You'll get it. It was so funny. When I was looking for a picture of Rahab, this just literally jumped off the page at me. And you'll see it here in just a minute. We'll, we'll get that. But let's read Hebrews chapter 11. In closing, Hebrews chapter 11. Thirty through thirty-four. Mark, don't you just love the color that they have her in? It's not just the rope anymore. It's not just a strand of rope in her life anymore. It's her covering. What am I saying to you today? Jesus Christ is more than a rope. Amen. He's more than an ounce of blood. He is, come on, Sister Carolyn, he's your covering. Amen. He's your daughter's covering. He's your other daughter's covering. He's your granddaughter's covering. He's your husband's covering. Isn't that such a beautiful picture right there? That's who we are. We are covered. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. Then, mm, hallelujah, Holy Spirit. I have to talk about this because I love talking about architecture. And it was something that finally I, uh, somebody shared that it just blew my mind. So Jericho, where it was at, remember when I told you there were layers? So they were like, they had to climb one layer to get to the next layer, next layer, right? Well, here's the thing. They had gone and they had churned up all the rock and the dirt so that when you climb these levels, they were soft. Your feet would sink into the, the ground, right? Let me tell you the amazing thing about God and his plan for the people to have victory over the city. Because it says that they walked around the city. Well, how can a people walk around a city who got their shoes dirty trying to climb up to the city, right? Until it hit me, there's a reason why God did not armor up Israel. Why they didn't have horse and chariots. Because they would have gotten stuck trying to climb the hill. All they had were sandals, which were lightweight. So guess what? When they were climbing up that dirt, it, they wouldn't sink. Right? They weren't going to sink. Right? So the people of Jericho are kind of in awe of the fact that one day they look out and the people are walking around the city and they're like, wait, how'd they get up here? How did they climb up here? How did they get up here and walk around us? How did they figure that out? They should have sunk in the dirt. I'm here to tell you right now, there's a reason why you take your shoes off on holy ground. Because the holy ground isn't there so you'll sink in it. It's to lift you up and place you where you belong. And they belonged in the promised land. And there was no Jericho on the planet that was going to stand in the way of God's promise to them. And they were able to do what? Walk. They didn't throw spears. They, they didn't charge with swords. They didn't have the fanciest chariots. They were just very good at walking. Which, oh, by the way, can I just bring up Enoch again? Enoch walked with God. He was the best power walker on the planet because he actually walked right into heaven. I have found a new respect for walking. I used to hate walking. When Laura would take me to the gym, we'd get on the treadmill. She'd be walking. I'm like, oh, you're silly. We're going to run, run, run. And I'd run for five minutes, and my knees would start hurting because I have knees that just get sore from the running. And I would get upset. And I'm like, God, you, you, you made me a runner. And God was like, no, you like to run away. So I have slowed you down. I don't want you running away. I want you walking with me. So now I get on the treadmill for 40 minutes. I'm a walking. I'm a walking. I'm a walking. I'm just having a good old time listening to my praise and worship music or message or whatever. But I have learned how to walk with God because God says, I don't need you to run. I get you, George. You, you like to run away from me. No, 
Come walk with me. I love that song, Mama. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord, right? So check this out. It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed. Can I just jump up and down right now? Because that just gets me all excited. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed. It was by faith that George the rebellious sinner was not destroyed. I'm so grateful to God because he took my past and he crushed it. And he took the chains and he tore them apart so that they would never stick to me again. And then when I come to the Lord and I say, God, I just want to forgive you for my past. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) You're a child of God, George. You're my redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say it is so. Amen. So here it is. By faith, Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. For she had been given a friendly welcome. For she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to then say it? Now, this is interesting. This is Rahab. Hebrews 11. Abraham. Jacob. Isaac. Moses. Rahab. She gets a couple of verses. And then he says, oh, by the way, it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the other prophets, by faith these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. What are you saying, Pastor? What I am saying to you is that God wants you to know that he can use anybody he chooses to use. He literally gives Rahab more scriptures in Hebrews 11 than he gave David. And we know David, he was a man after God's own heart. And so was Rahab. She was a woman after God's own heart. Stop letting your past bring you down. Stop letting your inadequacies bring you down. I am talking to the folks in here who would who by terminology in this world would say, oh, they're just old folk. I don't see no old folk in this room. Do you hear me? Do you hear me, Carmen? I know what you, that you're over 80. Big deal. If God wants you to live to be 150, then all glory and praise to God. But 80 doesn't define your deathbed. God decides when you're going to get your death. So in the meantime, why don't you just live for God? Amen. That's all you 80-plus folk in here. A 96-year-old man got Jesus Christ. Come on now. So we know what God thinks about age. He used David as a teenager, and this message was to encourage teenagers because the ones who walk around the walls of the city are young people. You're going to Wales. You know why? They need young people. Because God's going to transform that nation again. And he's going to do it to a younger generation. Denise, he gave you all the children that you have, every single one of them, because you are a woman after his own heart. He understands the trial, trouble, tribulation you'll face as a mother. How many mothers here would say they face trial, trouble, tribulation? Amen. Yeah, I'm going to embarrass you, Emily. Let me tell you how I'm going to embarrass Emily, because, because, because our sister Delma sits next to a trial, trouble, tribulation sometimes, right? I'm just being real because I'm a, I'm a son to somebody, too. And I was a child trouble you listen to my parents. I heard my dad right now just say, amen, son, preach it. All right. Come on. But he gave you all of these children because he's going to raise up a great army out of this generation. And your children are going to be part of the move of God that this county needs. So whether or not right now you're ready for it, young man. Let me just tell you, I am not going to forget four years ago when you and I were at the zoo 
And you, you got that right, Sister Carolyn. I'm going to tell him. Let me just tell you right now. I didn't speak over you. You spoke to me. We walked out of the zoo. Everyone else was ahead, and it was just you and me. And you said, Pastor, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. What's on your mind, brother? And you said, Pastor, I'm going to be a preacher of the word like you someday. I take that seriously. That's why I'm standing here in front of you, because you were asking for my help, and I am here to help you, brother. I get it. You're a teenager. You're going through changes and friends and all. I get that. But I'm going to speak over you right now. The words that came out of your mouth came because God is in your life. And no matter what it is you're struggling with right now, God is going to have his way in your life. You will be a preacher of the word because God designed it that way. Your mother prayed for her children to go out and give the gospel. Millie, you're going to be doing that. All of your children are going to turn to the Lord and be used by God. So maybe today it's not so cool to be in church. That's okay. But I will tell you right now, God will move mightily in your life. And one day you'll be doing what pastor is doing. And you'll see a young man just like I see a young man. And you'll walk over and say, hey, hey, hey. I've been there. Amen. But I'm never going to forget what you told me four years ago. And I stood in agreement with you. Can I get a yes and amen in the house of the Lord this morning? The Spirit of God is moving. I don't see any prostitutes in this room this morning. Young man. Guys, can I have a minute? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Brother Mark, would you come? Brother Tracy, would you come? Brother Freddie, you're right here. Brother Richard, would you just kind of turn around where you're at right now? Brother Farzim, would you come? Making sure I've got all our men. Come on. Let's lay hands on this young man. Amen. Robert, God's been, he's been after you, but he's not chasing you out of desperation. He's running after you because he loves you so much. Look, your past is your past. God doesn't hold you to your past. He wants you to know that he has a purpose and a plan for your future. This has been spoken through the words of Larissa's grandma and her mom. But I stand in agreement with them that you are not called to chase lost animals. You are called to chase lost men. But to do that, you got to step out of your lost and be found, brother. It's time. It's time. Today is the day of your salvation. God is your salvation, my friend. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to prove it. I know that you're trying to. I know you're trying to prove that you're a good husband. I know you're trying to prove you're a good person. I'm here to tell you right now, there is none righteous. No, not one. None of us are good, but because we've given our lives to Jesus Christ, we are now godly. And I have these men to lay hands on you because they're not ashamed of you. And they're not afraid of you. They just see God wanting to work in you. But he's got to be the Lord of your life, Robert. He's got to be the Lord of your life today. And I think you've wanted that for a little while. Ever since you've walked through these doors, you have sensed salvation, but you've been unsure as to whether or not you really could have it. I'm here to tell you this morning, you can have it. Do you want to make him the Lord of your life today? I thought so. I felt led by the Spirit. 
So we're going to pray over you. You heard me say what you need to say, right? Are you a sinner? Do you need a savior? Well, I'm here to tell you his name is Jesus. Do you want him to make him the Lord of your life today? I want to see you do that too. And so here's how we do it. First of all, tell him, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me clean. I'm ready to make you my Lord. I believe in you. More importantly, thank you for believing in me and for loving me. I know you were raised from the dead. Jesus, I know you're alive and well. Now be alive and well in me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us rejoice, church. Let us rejoice. We love you, man. We love you. Praise the Lord. Amen. See these men. Angels are having a party. Don't leave without getting in contact with them. You need this connection. You need these men in your life. That's why they're here. Amen. But Robert, I want to speak this over you. In order to fulfill your calling, you had to give your life to Jesus. Now that you've given your life to Jesus, let me tell you what your calling is. You've been called to be a preacher of the word, too. You've been called to be a preacher of the word, too. I've got preachers in this house, Mark. We're raising up preachers in this house. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord. Let's give glory in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Look, I still believe there's one or two people in here that need to give their lives to Jesus. I'm not going to force you. You do it when you're ready. But, Robert, I knew you were ready today, buddy.